opportunity to present this data today, which comes from my PhD. I'm going to focus on a particularly interesting observation described in the title, which may change the way we think about glioma cell biology and ultimately lead to the, a difference in the way that we can treat patients. So I'll tell you a bit about why I think glioma research is a high priority for basic scientists to be involved in. I'll then present my data, um, which I hope you'll see supports our, our, um, our findings. And um, I then summarize where I'd like to take this work and, and the implications really for, um, for the wider field. So glioma is the most common intracranial neoplasm. Actually, in, in general medicine, people might not come across it very um, often. But for us as neurosurgeons, it's one of the, the commonest tumors we operate on. Unfortunately, glioblastoma is the most common of the gliomas, and it's also the most aggressive. And we can learn all we need to know about the management of a glioma just by looking at the, uh, the diagram on the left-hand side. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve um, that comes from a, a landmark study back in 2005. So in this study, patients who had had surgery were randomized to receive either radiotherapy alone, indicated with the orange line, or radiotherapy plus tumors online. And it's clear from the, the chart that the, the patients who received the combined adjuvant therapy did better. But even in this patient group, the prognosis was still only just over 14 months. And if you want to understand what's changed since 2005, well, very little. In order to, to realize why the prognosis for these patients is so poor, I've included an axial uh, CT scan here of a patient with glioma. Gliomas are intrinsic to the brain. The cells invade and they cross normal um, anatomical boundaries. They, they spread along white matter tracks. As much as it pains me as a neurosurgeon to say this, this is not a disease that can be treated surgically. We need chemotherapies. And yet what's quite incredible is that temozolomide first came into clinical practice back in the 1980s. And yet it's still our go-to drug for glioblastoma. If you want to know what's happened in the meantime, well, there have been other compounds. They've come through the uh, laboratory, and they've appeared to offer promise, but they've never translated effectively into clinical trials. And we think the reason for this is because the models that have been used in the laboratory in order to select these compounds haven't accurately recapitulated human disease. So I'll explain what I mean. Traditionally, people have thought of glioma as a disease that arises from cells, such as differentiated astrocytes, differentiated oligodendrocytes. These cells would acquire mutations in a stepwise manner until they ultimately developed a malignant phenotype. And it's these models which form the basis on which drugs were tested and, in fact, still are being tested. The idea that the cell of origin of glioma is a differentiated glial cell made sense when we thought that the brain contained terminally differentiated cells. But we've known for some time though, now that that's not entirely the case. Stem cells present during embryogenesis persist in small niches uh, discrete niches in the brain in adult life. And this is important because these stem-like cells, uh, well, not these exact stem-like cells, but stem-like cells, cells with stem-like characteristics, are increasingly being implicated in the pathogenesis of cancer. So from leukemias to breast cancer to bowel cancer. And in 2003, a team led by Peter Dirks demonstrated that there was a subpopulation of cells in human gliomas that had stem-like characteristics and that were responsible for tumor initiation and recurrence. And this diagram just summarized the idea here. So a cell with stem-like characteristics becomes a tumor initiating cell. It can produce more stem-like cells, and it can also produce differentiated cells. And what that gives us is the idea that a glioma is actually a heterogeneous mass of cells. So it contains differentiated um, cells, but it also contains stem-like cells and progenitor-like cells. What we now know is the current radiotherapy and chemotherapy regimens only target the differentiated cells. The stem cells, or the stem-like cells, appear to have an innate resistance. So the differentiated cells disappear. The tumor belt reduces. We think from the CT scan we've, we've had success. But the tumor simply recurs from those stem-like cells that have been left behind. If then we could model those stem-like cells in vitro, we could select inhibitor compounds that hopefully would have more effect when we then translate them into the clinic. So to summarize the problem, it's the invasion of glioma cells into the brain that limits the efficacy of surgery. But at the same time, there's been a failure to translate therapies, chemotherapies that seemed effective in the laboratory into clinic. So our hypothesis was that if we could better model glioma in the laboratory in a way that better recapitulates human disease, then we can identify compounds which will downgrade the aggressiveness of the tumor and really turn it into a localized disease that the surgeons can then tackle effectively. So this is how I did it. 
So we took tumor samples from over 20 human gliomas uh, across a range of histological uh, grades and histological types. We then developed a protocol building on the existing literature in order to turn those tissue samples into glioma stem cell-like um, cells in primary culture. Now, I won't go into the detail of how we did that. I'm happy to tell anyone if they want to know. But basically, the technique builds on the, the culture of normal neural stem cells. So cells with stem-like characteristics will survive. Differentiated cells will die. And so what did we find? Well, the panel here illustrates the typical appearance of the glioma stem-like cells in culture. So they have a, a small nucleus. They have branched, narrow um, cytoplasmic processes. And for the purposes of the talk, I'm going to refer to these as cells as having a branch phenotype. Now, this is exactly the same picture you'll see in, in multiple publications about glioma stem-like cells. And when we started the project, we expected that this would be the appearance of the cells throughout all the primary cultures we developed. But that wasn't the case. What we began to notice is that there were a smaller number of cultures, but cultures nonetheless, where the phenotype of the cells was different. The nuclei was larger. There was more abundant cytoplasm. And again, for the purposes of the talk, I've labeled this second group of cells as having a flat phenotype. The important experiment was to go to a glioma and take discrete biopsies of tissue from around the brain, as indicated by these red dots. When we then grew primary cultures from all three biopsies, or all four biopsies, sometimes the cells all had the same phenotype, but sometimes they were different. And this table just illustrates a, a sample of tumors. What this meant was that the cell phenotype didn't simply reflect the histology of the tumor, it hinted that there was something more biological about the difference, and that gave us the impetus to go and uh, find out more. So I performed a whole battery of, uh, of tests of biological function. But just to pull out a few important points, there were similarities in, in some aspects of the biology of these two cell phenotypes. For example, using Western blotting or immunofluorescence techniques, they both express markers of stem cells, such as nesting, perhaps as we would expect. But perhaps more informative are the differences. If we look at the, the figure on the left, the, the branch phenotype cells indicated in green grew or proliferated much faster than the flat phenotype cells. In fact, the branch phenotype cells would proliferate indefinitely, whereas after about 10 passages, the, the, sorry, the branch phenotype cells would proliferate indefinitely. After about 10 passages, the flat phenotype cells and the new ones that uh, we were characterizing um, slowed their proliferation rate and underwent senescence. So actually, they might not be as stem cell-like as the branch phenotype cells. Another important assay of stemness is the ability of a single cell to form a clone. And when we perform this assay in our branch phenotype cells, so the cells which are similar to the other stem, glioma stem cells described in the literature, they could all show a positive result to the ability to form clones. Conversely, none of the flat phenotype cells could do this. So this made us take a step back. We actually wondered whether this, this apparently novel cell type was simply a bystander cell that we'd picked up in the tissue biopsies. Maybe it didn't have any importance for the biology of the tumors. To address this question, we, we asked, are there any mutations that are present in the tumors and present in the primary cultures derived from those tumors, but not present in the patient's somatic genome? And we used blood from the patient uh, um, to derive their somatic genome. This is an array CGH. The, the black dots indicate the DNA copy number changes relative to a control. And what this shows is that in a, a typical branch phenotype cell, there's a region of DNA copy number change which is present in the tumor, present in the primary culture derived from the tumor, and not present in the patient's normal somatic genome. So this indicates that those cells, these typical glymostem-like cells, are a valid representation of the tumors from which they've been derived. And actually, we found the same result in the flat phenotype cells. Now, the size of the DNA copy number changes in this second group of cells were smaller and occurred less frequently than those in the branch phenotype cells. And in those tumors where we could take multiple biopsies and where those different biopsies developed into primary cultures with different cell phenotypes, what we observed was that the flat phenotype cells the new ones I'm describing, tended to come from regions of the tumor with fewer mutations than the regions that gave rise to the branch phenotype cells. So we're beginning to get an idea that both sets of cells are related to the tumor, but in different ways. These cell types are not simply variants of the same cell. They perhaps have different biological functions. 
So the next question really was, well, is there anything we can do to try and understand what those functions are? Because that might inform um, our understanding of, of what the cells do. So the approach we take, took to do this was to take a sample of primary cultures characterized by different cell phenotypes. We analyzed the gene expression of all those cells, and then we performed unsupervised clustering to ask the question, is the gene expression in any individual primary culture more or less like the gene expression in the next one? And that gives us this graph here. The take-home message, really, is that the gene expression profile of all the branch phenotype cultures we tested were more similar to each other than they were to the gene expression profile of any of the flat phenotype cells. Where both these different cell phenotypes were seen in the same tumor, this, still, uh, this was uh, still the case. So there's a fundamental difference in these cells that matches with the cell phenotype and is independent of, of, of the tumors from which they came. This experiment gave us a, 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 a list of gene expression which was characteristic of each cell phenotype. So we then used a, an online a functional annotation tool which asks the question, um, is the gene expression profile predictive of any particular type of cell functions? Now, as we would have hoped, um, it told us that these branch phenotype cells have a glial neuronal-like function. So that's consistent with all the literature about the, what I'm calling the traditional glioma stem-like cells. Interestingly, our novel type of cell was said to have a mesenchymal-like function. Perhaps not a surprise in terms of its slightly mesenchymal appearance, its slightly indolent behavior, but quite a surprise when we think that both these cell types have been derived under the same culture, cell, cell culture conditions from human brain. In, and really, we would, we, we would have expected them to have a more of a neuronal uh, glial phenotype. <coughs> so this took us back to um, our, original, um, our original question, which was about invasion. Um, this is quite a long time since we'd hoped to get to the stage in, in the research, but we, we wanted to compare if we think there's a difference in biological function, um, is this something we can assay? Because if it is something we can assay, then that emphasizes the need to model these two cells um, in, our, in our drug screening. So we developed a modified inverse invasion assay. We managed to optimize the conditions uh, for it to work in, with glioma stem -like cells. So the cells get, so you can't see the green very well, but the, the cells get plated underneath the filter. They migrate up through the filter, and then they invade up through the, uh, the collagen matrix. We can analyze the distance they invade using confocal microscopy and then plot it on these charts here. So what the, this chart shows is this is the average distance of invasion. These are the um, uh, alphabetical annotations of the different primary cultures, and I've annotated them with an F or a B, indicating whether they contain flat or branch phenotype cells. And what you can see here is that the flat phenotype cells invaded further in any other time period than the branch phenotype cells, and that this was statistically significant. And more importantly, when we took both branched and flat phenotype cells from the same tumor, this still held true, and the difference was still statistically significant. So what this tells us is that this second cell phenotype that we've observed does have an important biological function, and it invades further and faster into, um, into our in vitro model. And therefore, when we've recognized that invasion is an important thing to sort out in glioma, this cell is perhaps something that we should be really um, thinking about when we're, we're modeling in vitro. So Two minutes, Paul. Perfect. So um, we started off with a, a traditional um, a glioma stem-like cell. I'm proposing that this, this work hints that there may be a second cell out there, that it does have some stem-like features, some, maybe some mesenchymal-like features. Um, and we need to understand, uh, understand those better to really see where w this work is going. Um, it may be that there is a mesenchymal stem-like um, function going on there. It may be that the genetics of the, of the difference tumors predicts what, um, what the outcome in terms of cell phenotype is. It may be that once we understand this, we can then look back in the other types of tumors in breast cancer and bowel cancer and ask whether our focus on a single unifying uh, cancer stem cell is actually incorrect. And actually that there's a heterogeneous type of cancer stem cells which will actually inform our understanding of biology. And this is all important because it's about developing the inhibitor assays. It's about accurately recapitulating things in vitro so that the drugs we pick um, are, have got more chance of working in the clinic. And just as a, as a taster of why this is important, this um, is a compound, an example of a compound screen where we tested a traditional glioma cell 
um, against one of our glioma stem cells. So this is a compound which works at micromolar levels against our cells, but only at much greater concentrations um, against this cell line. So if this was pharma, they would have been this drug, um, and it wouldn't be going any further. But actually, we've shown across a whole panel of cell lines that this PR3 kinase inhibitor may be important. And so it introduces us to a, a whole new environment in which we can start looking for, for novel therapies to help the poor prognosis in these patients. So just to thank um, the people who helped supervise me and guide me through this project, especially the, uh, the ECAT team in Edinburgh, and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Questions, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, that was great, thank you very much. I, Just mention who you are. Oh, my name's Sophie Papper. I'm a medical oncologist from King's. I was wondering whether you've been able to isolate normal brain stem cells using your technique, and if so, how they compare morphologically, but also with your trans well assay to your two different malignant stem cell phenotypes. So I think I missed the first half of the question. I yeah. wonder whether you've been able to isolate sort of what you would consider normal stem cells from the stem cell niche oh, yeah. in the brain and whether you've been able to compare them to your two different types. So that's, that's the holy grail. Um, so <laughs> if, we, if, we could do, if we could go into theater and take out a tumor and at the same time just nip around into the ventricle and take out the subventricular zone, um, I think as long as we didn't tell anyone we were doing that, I think we, we'd be fine. Um, it's, it's definitely what we need to do, because then we could ask the question, if we take, if we t well, is there any relationship between our stem-like cells and the stem cells in the subventricular zone? It's still the big question, which no one really knows the answer to. And can we actually persuade the two cells to go backwards and forwards uh, to behave like each other? That's exactly the experiment I want to do. I just need to figure out the ethics of how to do it. We've got two questions on this side of the yeah. room, uh, there and then further on the left. Uh, thanks, Alistair Lamb, Cambridge. Um, th thanks, Paul. I know you deliberately skipped over it quite quickly. Um, and you mentioned that when you were generating or deriving your cells that you depend on a culture medium for that. But yeah. I just wondered whether you also used an IPS approach. And if so, what factors did you use? Yeah, no, I did, didn't use an, an IPS approach. Uh, I actually worked alongside, I don't know if you recognize some of the names, uh, but of, of people who do work on IPS. I was, this was very much a, if you, if you, get, if you, want, if you take out a, a mouse hippocampus or a rat hippocampus and you, and you grow neural stem cells, this is very much based on that basic technique. I think the, the issue of using IPS either to generate cancer stem-like cells or to turn cancer stem-like cells back into normal stem-like cells, as, as you were suggesting, um, it's an experiment some of my collaborators are doing in Edinburgh. It's a great experiment. And there was another question just on the left there. Uh, Edwin Jezidace in Liverpool, thank you for your talk. Uh, two questions. In, in pediatric tumours like neuroblastoma, there's interest in using differentiation therapies yeah. on the basis that if you've got cancer stem cells, there'll be low cell turnover and antimitotic therapies may not be the way to go. So the first question is, is that something that is used in, in, in glioma? And the second question was just whether you could comment on a report that I, I saw but didn't have time to, to look into in depth where people had used nanofibers to try and encourage glioma cells to migrate down them to points where they could be more accessible to therapy. Okay. Um, I, I've not read that, report, that second report. It's, it's quite a nice idea. Um, I don't think I'd want to encourage glioma cells to go anywhere. Um, <laughs> I think the, the first part of your question is, is exactly what we need to do. Um, so I think, I think persuading them to stop invading is about um, differentiating them into, in some, into something that's very indolent. I mean, even if we could just double the life expectancy of these patients to three years, they might be sat there with a glioma in their head. Um, but as long, if it's more differentiated and it doesn't do anything, that's exactly what we need. Um, and I think that's, that's a sort of parallel, isn't it, in, in, with the IPS tech, uh, uh, technology, is that if we can control the state of differentiation, maybe we can control the sort of uh, the malignant phenotype of these cells. And I think that's a real challenge. Yeah. That's it. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Thank you.